Broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Nantan Lupin. My name is John, and you can find the show on iTunes by searching for classic movie reviews and then looking for The Wolf. We have links in the podcast notes and at snarkymoviereviews.com for Twitter, Facebook, and Stitcher. We appreciate your support. Now enjoy the show. Today we have episode 31, Warlock, 1959. I'm sorry if you were expecting a horror film, as this is a classic western. We are continuing the Richard Widmark line that was begun in episode 23, The Long Ships, 1964. This is a very complex movie, and I will use a quote from the Tennessee wordsmith with a link on WordPress to outline the movie. Imagine a movie with an intricate plot, driven not so much by events as by the tangled relationships between several well-drawn characters. It is a movie with obvious homoerotic undertones and some surprisingly intense violence. To further stretch your imagination, envision it as a film made in 1959 and a Western at that, unquote. That's a pretty good summary, so I'll jump right into the characters. Richard Widmark played Johnny Gannon, one of the cowboys that walked away from the gang. I covered Widmark extensively in episode 23, The Longships, 1964. Henry Fonda was cast as Clay Blaisdell, a gunslinger and marshal for hire. He was also a gambler and runner of the faro wheel. They liberally borrowed from Wyatt Earp for this part. Henry Fonda was born in Nebraska, which probably contributed to his even pace and speech patterns. Fonda moved from the Omaha Community Playhouse, the Cape Cod University Players, and finally to Broadway where he remained until 1934. He has so many great roles, listing just a few will give a disservice to many others. Over his 50 years of movies, I will list just what is important to me. They include Young Mr. Lincoln, 1939, Drums Along the Mohawk, 1939, The Grapes of Wrath, 1940, The Oxbow Incident, 1943, My Darling Clementine, 1946, as a Wyatt Earp-type character, Fort Apache, 1948, Mr. Roberts, 1955, Twelve Angry Men, 1957. How the West Was Won, 1962. The Longest Day, 1962. Advise and Consent, 1962. Spencer's Mountain, 1963. Failsafe, 1964. Battle of the Bulge, 1965. In Harm's Way, 1965, which was covered in Episode 4. A Big Hand for the Little Lady, 1966. Once Upon a Time in the West, 1968, Sometimes a Great Notion, 1970, The Cheyenne Social Club, 1970, Midway, 1976, and On Golden Pond, 1981. In his career, he was nominated for two Oscars and won one for playing the old poop in On Golden Pond, 1981. He is the father of Peter and Jane Fonda, as well as the grandfather of Bridget Fonda. Anthony Quinn played the partner of Clay Blaisdell, Tom Morgan. Quinn was born in Chihuahua, Mexico in 1915. The family moved to Los Angeles where Quinn attended but eventually dropped out of high school. Quinn spent some time boxing and then studied architecture with Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright encouraged Quinn to try acting and by 1936 he was in Hollywood. Quinn's first role in Tinseltown was The Plainsman, 1936, directed by his future father-in-law, Cecil B. DeMille. That's one way to make it big. As part of the studio system at Paramount, Quinn was given many ethnic bit parts. Since he was not a U.S. citizen, he did not serve in World War II and received extra roles as many actors were away. At the end of his contract, he returned to the stage to sharpen his skills. Ilya Kazan cast Quinn and Marlon Brando as brothers in Viva Zapata, 1952. Quinn won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor and became the first Mexican-American to win one of the Golden Statues. Quinn wasn't done as he got his second one for Lust for Life, 1966, opposite the great Kirk Douglas. He continued to work in the U.S. and Italy. In 1957, he received a third nomination, this time for Best Actor. Wild is the Wind, 1957. In 1961, Quinn was cast as a Greek in The Guns of Navarone. He played a down-and-out boxer in Requiem for a Heavyweight, 1962, One of his two greatest roles was that of an Arab leader in Lawrence of Arabia, 1962. The other was Zorba the Greek, 1964, where he was again nominated for Best Actor. In 1968, Quinn had a hit and a miss. 
He hit with the portrayal of a humble pope in the Shoes of the Fisherman, 1968, but missed with the Magnus, 1968. The 70s found him forced to return to small ethnic roles. He continued to act into the 90s before retiring to run a restaurant in Rhode Island. He died at the age of 86. Dorothy Malone was cast in the role of Lily Dollar. That could be the greatest saloon girl name ever. I have to admit I didn't know much about Malone when I started this review. She was very beautiful with blonde hair and dreamy eyes. Malone was born in Chicago but was raised in Dallas. After high school, she attended Southern Methodist University with plans on being a nurse, but an RKO talent scout saw her in a college play and she was offered a contract. Since the studio system was in full swing, they started training the, at the time, brunette and cast her in small roles. However, at the end of the two years, they let her contract end. Warner Brothers picked up her contract and cast her in The Big Sleep 1946 with Bogey and Bacall. The moviegoers liked what they saw. The studio gave her some large western roles which showed her writing skills but did little to advance her career. In 1949, Warner Brothers did not renew her contract and she returned to her family in Texas. Malone tried to settle into an insurance job, but a trip to New York hooked her again. She moved to New York and began studying acting. In between studies, she took roles in B-Westerns and other films. In 1954, as a platinum blonde, she starred in Young at Heart, 1954, with Doris Day. In Battle Cry, 1955, she had a smoky love scene with all-American boy Tab Hunter. Now with Universal, she made a few more Westerns before landing the role of a sultry nymphomaniac in Written on the Wind, 1956. The leads for this film were Rock Hudson and Lauren Bacall, but co-stars Robert Stack and Malone stole the show. They were both nominated for an Oscar, and Malone won in her category. Then it was back to B-movies. As her career slowed, she married and had children. Her second child had just been born when she took the role in Warlock. She left acting shortly after this movie and didn't begin working on television until the early 1960s with Peyton Place. After her television career ended, she once again returned to Dallas. Her last film was a cameo in Basic Instincts, 1992. Like Betty Field, she was a great actress that never found the right vehicle to take her to the top. Dolores Michaels was cast as Jesse Marlowe, the love interest of Clay Blaisdell, Henry Fonda. I gave a longer bio of Michaels in episode 26, Time Limit, 1957. Wallace Ford played the role of Judge Holloway. Ford had over 200 roles in his 30-plus year career. Born in England, Ford was separated from his parents and grew up in a Canadian foster home. After coming to the U.S., Ford worked in vaudeville and in regional theater. He made it to Broadway by 1921. In 1932, Ford signed with MGM and made two movies, Possessed and Freaks. In Freaks, 1932, he played the kind clown, Faros. A couple of years later, Ford was in The Lost Patrol, 1934, with Boris Karloff. Although he had a good start, Ford never became a big star, but he worked steadily as a character actor. By the 1950s, Ford had put on a lot of weight and had a lot more gray. Often called the second part of his career, he began to show up as a bit character in westerns, such as The Man from Laramie, 1955, with Jimmy Stewart, and this movie, Warlock, with Henry Fonda and Richard Widmark. He died within months of his wife of 44 years in 1966. Richard Arlen had a small role as Bacon. The story sounds a little wild, so I'm not sure if it's true. Arlen was a pilot in the Royal Canadian Flying Corps in World War I, but never saw combat. Following the war, he was kicking around until he ended up becoming a motorcycle messenger in Los Angeles. One day, he crashed his bike into Paramount's gate and broke his leg. When they saw his good looks, they gave him an acting contract. His first big break came in the William Wellman classic Wings, 1927, as one of the pilots. His career continued into the talkie era until the end of the 1940s when he went deaf. In 1949, he had an ear operation and returned to making movies in the 50s and 60s. DeForest Kelly was cast as Curly Burn. He was a member of the Cowboys that eventually had a redeeming quality. Of course, this character is named after cowboy Curly Bill Brocious. I covered Kelly in episode 16, Night of the Leapus, 1972, so I won't add any more here except this movie showed me what a great actor he really was. Vaughn Taylor was cast as Henry Richardson. He worked with a pencil-thin mustache and has been described as an accountant. He struggled as an actor prior to his service in the Army during World War II. 
Following the war, he consistently received small parts in movies and serials. Two of his most important roles were in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, 1958, and as the boss of Janet Leigh in Psycho, 1960. On television, he was on The Twilight Zone five times. Final problems forced Vaughn to retire from acting in 1976. Whit Bissell played a small role as Petrix. Every time this guy shows up, I skip over him because he has a small role. But it's always a solid performance, and like a great actor should, he pulls off his role. Bissell does it again. Well, no more. The line stops here. Bissell ended his career with over 200 credits. These include the evil scientist that turned Michael Landon into a lycanthrope, and I was a teenage werewolf, 1957, and more serious roles such as Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962, Gunfight at the OK Corral, 1957, HUD, 1963, Seven Days in May, 1964, The Hallelujah Trail, 1965, and Soylent Green, 1973. He was also featured in the time-traveling television show The Time Tunnel from 1966 to 1967. Frank Gorshwin played Billy Gannon, the brother of Johnny Gannon, Richard Widmore. He spoke and was shot down in the middle of Main Street and was somehow uncredited in this film. Gorshwin was born in Pittsburgh. When he was in high school, he worked at a movie theater and that's where he started doing impressions. He won a talent contest and met Alan King. He attended drama school and performed at nights. In 1953, he was drafted into the Army and stationed in Germany. He worked in the Special Services, which should never be confused with the Special Forces. Following his time in the Army, an agent that he met through an Army buddy got him a role in The Proud and the Profane, 1956. He was offered a role in Run Silent, Run Deep, 1958, but crashed his car as he was driving cross-country. When he woke up four days later, the role had gone to funny man Don Rickles. Gorshin began making B-movies such as Hot Rod Girl 1956, Drag Strip Girl 1957, and Invasion of the Saucer Men 1957. However, my favorite is his role as Coke Bottle Lens wearing Basil in Where the Boys Are 1960. The scene where he dives in the mermaid tank in Florida without his glasses is one for the riot reel. Gorshman really made it big when he got the role of the Riddler on Batman 1966. In all, he had over 70 movies and made 40 guest appearances on television series. Gorshman died at age 72 in California. L.Q. Jones played Finn Jiggs, a messenger, but was uncredited. Born in Texas, he took his stage name from the character he played in Battle Cry 1955. Jones was rail thin with a sharp, angular face. This led him to be cast in many World War II films, such as The Young Lions, 1958, The Naked and the Dead, 1958, Hell is for Heroes, 1962, and The Battle of Coral Sea, 1959. In 1962, he began working with director Sam Peckinpah. He was in Ride the High Country, 1962, Major Dundee, 1965, with Charlton Heston, The Wild Bunch, 1969, with pal Struther Martin, Again with Martin in The Ballad of Cable Hogue, 1970, and in Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, 1973. Jones began directing and shot A Boy and His Dog, 1975, starring a young Don Johnson. He kept working on the stage and screen, playing the same type of characters. One of my favorites was as the retired Texas Ranger, Dakota, along with Chuck Norris in Lone Wolf McQuaid, 1983. One of his last big roles was that as a powerful player in state politics along with Robert De Niro and Martin Scorsese's mob flick, Casino, 1995. Gary Lockwood played one of the cowboy gang members and was uncredited. This was Lockwood's first movie role. I covered him in episode 24, The Magic Sword, 1962. Story. Warlock is a small western town in the 1880s. The west is starting to simmer down as more school marms and church people arrive, and the country heads towards the 20th century. However, there are a group of cowboys from one of the ranches led by Abe McEwen, Tom Drake, that don't want to give up their old rootin' tootin' cowboy ways. I took a little time to look up this often used cowboy phrase. The rootin' part comes from poking around, and the tootin' part is from blowing a horn, not eating beans by a campfire as suggested in Urban Dictionary and Blazing Saddles, 1974. Well, anyway, the cowboys come into town a rootin' and a tootin' and a shootin', The mob of cowboys face down the sheriff and run him out of town in the most unceremonious way. His name is scratched from the walls as part of a long list of sheriffs that have already been sent packing. 
One of the cowboys, Johnny Gannon, played by Richard Widmark, is drinking heavily, and I thought he was going to be like Robert Mitchum slash Dean Martin in El Dorado 1966 slash Rio Bravo 1959, but Johnny doesn't really take part in any of the meanness. When the cowboys get ready to leave town, Johnny's brother, Billy, played by Frank Gorshin, had to scoop him up from the alley to take him home. One of the drunken cowboys murders the barber for nicking him during a shave. The town committee holds a meeting and they decide to hire a town marshal, Clay Blaisdell, played by Henry Fonda, who is a gunfighter and has cleaned up many a western town. The town is named Warlock, but it has often been said that Clay's character was a male witch or a warlock with his gun. Judge Holloway, Wallace Ford, wants to keep using traditional law enforcement and Jesse Marlowe, Dolores Michaels, opposes hiring the gold-handled, pistol-wearing pseudo-lawman. Is this, um, superhuman going to subdue the savage breast by the pure power of his eye, or by the menace of a six-shooter, or simply by his reputation? None of those, Miss Jesse. Blaze his only hope in Warlock is to be lead-proof. Clay arrives in town with a pharaoh wheel, a French palace saloon sign, and friend Tom Morgan, played by Anthony Quinn. Morgan decorating the living quarters for both men is an odd scene. Morgan, who is devoted to Clay, is an ex-soldier with a club foot. It was at this point in the movie that I realized that this was a chopped up version of the gunfight at the OK Corral, with Clay as Wyatt Earp and Morgan as Doc Holliday and, well, the Cowboys as the Cowboys. Historically, Morgan was the name of one of Earp's brothers, and Doc Holliday was sick with tuberculosis, but in this case it was changed to a club foot. The Cowboys come to town to have a showdown with Clay, but by the clever placement of shotguns, they are able to force the Cowboys to back down, making the Cowboys angrier than ever. Johnny Cannon leaves the Cowboys and remains in town. After some time has passed, Finn Jiggs, L.Q. Jones, tells Morgan that his old sweetheart, Lily Dollar, played by Dorothy Malone, is coming on the stage with Bob Nicholson, Saul Gross, the brother of Big Ben Nicholson, who Clay recently killed. Apparently, Lily had left Morgan for Big Ben, and she knows that Morgan tricked Clay into killing him. Morgan heads out of town towards the stage, but he sees some of the cowboys heading to rob the stage. He sets up a firing position, and when Nicholson is forced out of the stage by the bandit, Morgan shoots him from a distance, unseen by all. When Lily arrives in town and sees Morgan, she suspects he is behind the shooting. Morgan asks her to come back to him, and she implies that he has pimped her out before when he needed money. I'd give a lot more to have you come back to me, Lily. For what? So that you could send me back to work whenever you run short of money? I thought you did it because you loved me. <laughs> How could I have ever? They arrest the stagecoach robbers, including Billy. Johnny Gannon's brother. The law has to protect the three robbers from a mob in Warlock and sends them to Bright City for trial where they are released by people that are afraid of the cowboys. The Bright City Sheriff is looking for a new Warlock deputy and Johnny Gannon takes the job. Billy Gannon and the two other robbers come into town seeking revenge against Clay. Johnny Gannon refuses to take sides and begs his brother not to fight Clay. In the gun battle, two of the three are killed and some town folks begin to turn against Clay. Curly Byrne, played by DeForest Kelly, posts signs saying that the Cowboys are regulators and have a right to kill Clay. Of course, Curly is the name of one of the Cowboys from the historic O.K. Corral. As many in the town grow tired of the gunfighters, at the same time Jesse Marlowe, Dolores Michaels, tracks him down and they fall crazy in love and Clay is going to settle down in Warlock. Morgan blows a gasket when he hears the news. The Cowboys come to town to face down Gannon for turning on the gang and enforcing the law. Clay is going to help, but Morgan holds a gun on him and keeps him out of the fight. Gannon wins the shootout because Curly stops a back shooter. Again, Morgan goes crazy because Clay is not the hero of the town. Morgan starts drinking and shooting up the town. Clay locks Gannon in the jail and goes to stop Morgan. Morgan shoots off Clay's hat and Clay fires back, killing him. Morgan dies happy that Clay is now back on top. I'm going to tell you something, Clay. What is it, Morgan? I'm better than you. I've always been better. I can beat you, Clay. Now you hit it. And you better hit it fast. (laughs) 
I want Clay. Clay carries Morgan into the saloon and changes as he does. He kicks a crutch out from under the judge. I've had too much of you. Crawl for it. Crawl past him. It was a man. I don't talk. He then burns the saloon in what may have been characterized as a Viking funeral for his friend. Gannon, being upset that he was locked in the jail, orders Clay out of town by morning. Jesse begs Clay to stay, but he says he can't be a farmer or a store clerk. What would I do here, Jesse? Stay with me as we planned. What would I do? I don't know. Whatever you planned on doing before this happened. I never saw it past this morning. I suppose I figured Morgan and I. What now? I clerk in Richardson's store. Sell needles to old ladies. I take over McCune's spread, nurse calves. I'm a miner, live in darkness. You love me, Clay. None of these things would be bad. Lily, who is now romantically involved with Gannon, begs Clay for Gannon's life. Clay and Gannon meet in the street in the morning, and Clay is wearing his gold-handled revolvers. Clay easily outdraws Gannon, but each time throws his gun in the dirt. Clay rides away to find another town and another Morgan. I have listed 15 gunfights at the OK Corral. All are movies except for the Star Trek episode, which DeForest Kelly was also in. Frontier Marshal, 1934, with George O'Brien. Dodge City, 1939, with Errol Flynn. Frontier Marshal, 1939, with Randolph Scott. Tombstone, The Town Too Tough to Die, 1942, with Richard Dix. My Darling Clementine, 1946, with Henry Fonda. Angel and the Bad Man, 1947, with John Wayne. Wichita, 1955, with Joel McRae. Gunfight at the OK Corral, 1957, with Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas. Cheyenne Autumn, 1964, with James Stewart. Gunman of the Rio Grande, 1965. Hour of the Gun, 1967, with James Garner. Spectre of the Gun, 1968, an original Star Trek episode. Doc, 1971. Tombstone, 1993, with Kurt Russell. And that terrible Wyatt Earp, 1994, with Kevin Costner. This was an odd little movie where Morgan clearly hero-worshipped Clay if he was not in love with him. When Morgan was gone, Clay realized that he could not live without him. World-famous short summary. Buddies have a difference of opinions about work. Thank you for listening. You can find our show on iTunes by searching for Nantan Lupan or Classic Movie Reviews. There are links to all other media like Facebook, Twitter, Stitcher, etc. at snarkymoviereviews.com and in the podcast notes. You can really help the podcast by subscribing and leaving iTunes reviews. Beware the moors.